Hi, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, can I get your attention? Very good. That gentleman should be a lawyer. <laughs> Very good, or a judge, even better. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Colin Crawford. I'm the incoming dean of the Brandeis School of Law. Um, I saw many of you, the Central High School students, uh, earlier this morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here once again and also to welcome other guests. Uh, before I, I pass the words to the speakers, I just wanted to say that it's been a real pleasure to see Professor Ariana Levinson working to get this event together. Uh, these issues of labor and employment rights and the questions of uh, cooperatives that they're going to be looking at today are uh, undoubtedly going to become more and more important uh, in this generation as we're going through times of great uncertainty, obviously, in our uh, labor market. So this could not be more timely. I had the pleasure last night of having dinner with a number of people here, including uh, your uh, principal speaker, uh, Professor Carmen Huertas uh, Noble, and uh, so I know that this will be a, a, a very robust and uh, interesting dialogue. So once again, welcome. This is a terrific event, and I look forward to uh, the continuing project of which this is a part. I don't know if Professor Levinson intended to share this, but I, I would encourage her to explain how this fits into a larger project, because it's uh, indeed a very ambitious endeavor. Uh, so with that, let me pass this. Let me just uh, give my apologies. Apologies. Uh, Professor McNeil, are you next? Uh, before I pass this, Professor McNeil, uh, I actually am starting in three months, and unexpectedly I actually found an apartment that it appears like I'm buying, so I'm leaving now to go to the inspection for that apartment. So that's the only reason I'm not going to be here. Uh, my plan had been to be here, but uh, events have gotten uh, the better of me, and I want to be a permanent part of this community. So I think it's good for me to go and do that. So uh, once again, congratulations to Professor uh, Levinson and uh, Professor Huertas uh, Noble. I look very much forward to hearing uh, about this event afterwards. So let me pass this to my colleague, Professor Laura McNeil. All right, good afternoon. How are you guys doing today? Yay. Okay, so um, before I introduce our illustrious guest uh, for today's talk, um, I just wanted to thank the Diversity Committee for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Dean Crawford, even though he uh, we just missed him, uh, for funding uh, the majority of this event through the Dean's Faculty Scholarship Award for Professor Ariana Levinson. So I want to just acknowledge um, their support and thank them. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to... Um, Introduce uh, Professor Ariana Levinson. I'm super excited about uh, her participation in today's event. Uh, she's a full professor here um, at the Brandeis School of Law and a fellow at the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations. Um, the fellowship that she currently um, holds at Rutgers School of Management um, enables her to study worker-owned cooperatives, uh, work with experts uh, in other fields from across the nation, and write some really compelling scholarship uh, regarding worker ownership. Uh, Professor Levison received a Corey Rosen Fellowship as well, Research Fellowship from the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations for the 2012 uh, 13 academic year, as well as a Michael W. Huber Fellowship um, as for the following year. Um, in conjunction with these fellowships, uh, she is a prolific writer. Um, one of the uh, articles she's published is entitled Funding Worker Cooperatives, Social Movement Theory and the Law, and that was published in the Nevada Law Review. Um, Professor Levison also serves as a faculty liaison um, to the Peggy Browning Fund and a co-planner for uh, the Warren's Render Labor and Employment Law Institute that is hosted annually here at the law school as part of a continuing legal education program. So we are excited and grateful to have Professor Levison here. As you can see, she's an amazing scholar. Um, we're glad to have her on our faculty. Um, our featured speaker today, uh, I'd like to extend a warm Brandeis welcome to Professor Carmen Huertas Noble. Um, she's the founding director of the Community and Economic, Economic Development Clinic at CUNY School of Law. Her scholarship emphasizes the role of lawyers in creating meaningful and client participatory decisions 
um, making processes as part of the lawyer's counseling process and in support of client-centered lawyering on behalf of alternative institutions. Uh, she received her Juris Doctorate degree from Fordham University Law School, where she was a Stein Scholar in Public Interest Law and Ethics, and has also served on the staff of the Environmental Law Journal. Uh, prior to journey, joining CUNY, uh, she served as a senior staff attorney in the Community Development Project of the Urban Justice Center. Um, she's also worked um, with the Rock New York organization in creating um, a phenomenal restaurant um, in Manhattan, New York, uh, called Colors. Um, incredible restaurant, a lot of um, uh, past presidents and uh, presidential uh, politicians and just very extinguished, uh, distinguished, excuse me, um, individuals in our communities have visited this phenomenal restaurant. Um, since then, um, she's worked uh, with numerous community groups and attorneys um, just to help them in uh, creating uh, structures to build these worker co-ops programs, which will be the focus of today's talk. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Levison and Professor Noble. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. So we decided to do this in a question and answer format. So I'll be having a conversation with Professor Huertas Noble. Um, I'll be asking her some questions and then she'll be sharing her amazing insights and her knowledge with us. Um, then we'll open this up for questions so that you guys can ask some questions of either of us that, um, that appeal to you. So. I know some of us in the room, we know what a worker-owned cooperative is, and others of us may not yet know what a worker-owned cooperative is. So when we're talking about a worker-owned cooperative, we're just talking about a company, a firm, a business, whatever word it is you like to choose, that we say is democratically managed. And the reason we say it's democratically managed is because every person who works there owns one share of the company, so everybody has an equal ownership right. And everybody who works there has one vote, so they can vote on important matters. And so that's how we understand what a worker-owned cooperative is. Um, and I'm going to ask Professor Ortez Noble to um, describe for us how she thinks of a worker-owned cooperative. But in particular, if you're someone who's not familiar with them, what do they bring to a, com to a community? What is it that a worker-owned cooperative can bring to a community? So I would say um, when I talk about worker co-ops, I say that they are collectively owned and democratically controlled, like Professor Levison just pointed out. And there are two main rights of ownership, right, in terms of profit sharing and governance. There are co-ops that do it on a very pure level where it's one, one person one vote um, and the profit gets shared equally and then there are co-ops that aren't really able to structure themselves that way because they have outside investment and it influences um, some of the governance but still even in those cases usually the workers have the majority control of the board so they have um, a powerful say in, in terms of how the organization is going to operate and how the business is going to operate. Um, when I went to law school, I had no idea that this would be the type of work that I was going to get into. I went thinking I'm going to legal services, legal aid. I ended up excelling in contracts and property, and I was like, okay, what do I do with this <laughs> for me? Um, but the thing that, the reason why I got into the work is because what it stands for in terms of local ownership, job creation, and then beyond that, asset and wealth creation, and keeping the profits local and circulating within the community. So I don't know if you're familiar with the term ex extractive capital. This is to avoid that. Instead of there being a board somewhere far away that makes the decision and then takes the profits from the community, it's locally owned. Um, and it's very unlikely that two thirds of an organization um, where people are living in the same community are going to pick up their business and go somewhere else. Um, they are also going to be more inclined to have care for community issues, um, not just themselves, because at least for me it's not about duplicating or replicating the status quo. 
Um, and, you know, it's crass as this may sound, if we are all in the same co-op and in the same community, we're, we're going to be less likely to pollute the water that we all drink from because it's not a community far away. Um, so the other part of it is also the income. So for me, the reason why a living wage is important, and I know this is just kind of obvious, but I like to remind people um, because you do get some folks who are like, oh, you know, isn't that greed or whatever the commentary might be. But income means a lot of things for different people, right? It, it could mean your ability to save up to go to school, to go to college. It could mean if you are a parent that you have more time with your children, that you're not floating back and forth between the different jobs um, and, and what we're now calling the gig economy. Um, so it can really stabilize people, individuals, and families in a way that I think is just as important as creating wealth. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, Professor Ortiz Noble not only um, works with organizations throughout New York City and throughout the country on these issues, but she's also a prolific scholar who has written about these issues. And um, in, in particular, she's written about the role of the attorney in social movements, which I think is something that a lot of people in law school are interested in because they might want to become a social movement lawyer. Um, so uh, could you describe how lawyers um, are helping in the social movement of creating worker-owned cooperatives and what challenges lawyers face in that type of work? I think that there is the, um, there is the usual lawyering role of helping a group of people decide what type of entity they want to form. Um, Basically, any kind of business is formed under a statute, and that statute dictates what what um, type of business it is. Um, so we do a lot of counseling in terms of entity formation, governance, uh, and who has what powers, and how those powers are going to get exercised, and how are we going to make sure that it's it's a fair and principled way of operating. Um, that is less challenging than being part of the bigger movement. Uh, so there are a couple of things. I'll back up a little bit in terms of the lawyering. When you're lawyering for co-ops, you are lawyering for a group of people, which is very different than when you're lawyering for a single person. Um, so it can get challenging, especially if the group is come especially if the group finds themselves in disagreement um, and how do lawyers handle that. Do we get involved or do we step away and say, when you work it out, we'll come back. That is not my style in particular. Um, I always tell my law students, if you have a skill set that you're already bringing with you and you can help facilitate, you should go ahead and use that. Now, if you know you're not good at that, then you shouldn't do it. Um, but having taken mediation courses, I feel comfortable with helping folks um, solve, resolve disagreements. And I also see it as part of my counseling, right, in terms of if you go this way, this, you know, these are the pros and cons of this option. If you go that way, these are the pros and cons of, of the other option. Um, so that's a challenge. And then in New York City, where there's a worker cooperative business development initiative, the challenge is working with so many different co-ops um, in coalition. And if you, even if you're not a lawyer, if you've done coalition work, you know like building consensus and bringing people on board and making sure that everybody's on the same page um, is a really challenging task. And then I would say this, I really prefer it when there's a community resident that's leading that charge in terms of usurping leadership roles. If there is a if there is a gap, I don't mind stepping in temporarily, but I think the whole purpose for me in client-centered lawyering is to make sure that the clients feel empowered and after I leave that they can do and take over the business without a problem. 
So um, Professor McNeil mentioned the Colors Restaurant in her introduction, um, and this is something that Professor Wertes Noble was very involved with. Um, and this, um, this organization, Rock, and the co-op served what were low-wage, mostly immigrant workers. So we have a human rights project here that some of our students are part of, and these um, issues with immigrant workforce are, you know, if anything more important right now than mm -hmm. ever, um, finding ways that they can work legally. Um, so I was hoping you would just tell us a little bit about Colors, how it contributes to community mm -hmm. empowerment, and what, um, what legally was required to get it off mm. the ground? So actually, Colors was the first worker-owned co-op in New York, and so it was very challenging. It, I don't know how many people are familiar with this story, but it was right after 9-11. Um, a lot of the restaurant workers who did survive um, were out of work, and an organizer came to me, Saro Jaraman, and she was at that time the ED of um, Rock New York, which actually, actually she wasn't because I formed Rock New York for her, but she was coming with that goal. And then she said, ED you know, executive, executive director, director executive I'm sorry. Director. Um, and then she was like, you know, well, we want to start a worker co-op because we just don't want it to be a duplication of, of um, Windows on the World, which was very hierarchical. Um, and in her work, I will say, with Rock New York, um, it's, re it's a membership organization. So their, um, their members were involved at every stage of the process. And we met with them weekly, and we kind of broke down the issues in terms of the operating agreement, which is the governance agreement. And it took three years. Um, which is a, is a long time, except now it doesn't take three years. You know, like the first time you do something, it takes a little longer. Um, but it was really great to see them open up the worker-owned restaurant, especially because originally they were at a location where it was a very exploitive restaurant and they had had campaigns against it. So um, to be able to move into that space, to be able to have the workers, main, mostly who were coming from Windows of Windows on the World, um, have employment that wasn't just employment, but also about asset creation, um, was a real joy. Actually, the lawyering was hard, and you know, anytime you do something new, um, it's challenging. But it was kind of everybody, you know, all hands on deck. Everybody roll up your sleeves and get it done. Um, and they were able to, and I'm really impressed with them because most restaurants fail within the first year in New York City. I don't know if that's true across the board. Um, and they, they're they still open. Um, so they, they put a lot of sweat and energy and organizing into forming colors. They had tons of obstacles. There was a 9-11 fund after 9-11. They didn't get funding from that fund. Um, we suspected it was because the workers were mainly immigrants from across different backgrounds, um, but they still were able to pull it off. Uh, so I, I think that a lot of times when things seem impossible, if we just keep kind of plugging away, they will find a way to do it. Um, so yeah. That's uh, great. Um, advice, I think, for all the students here and mm -hmm. really inspiring. Um, so another organization that um, Professor Wittes Noble is involved with is um, the Green Worker Cooperatives. Um, so this is a whole network of cooperatives, mm -hmm. and I was um, just going to ask her to tell us about this and um, mm -hmm. kind of the importance of having a network of mm -hmm. cooperatives. So Green Worker Cooperatives um, was the first to create an academy where identifying people in the community that were interested in becoming entrepreneurs and then interested in collective ownership. And they go through training. And then after the training, um, the nonprofit helps them 
actually create the co-op. And there's two co-ops, well there's many, um, there's, I think they have about 10 now. Um, but they have very successful co-ops in terms of, there's a co-op where it's interpretation and translation and they have really gotten off the ground and are very successful and it's, it's, it's great to see. And then one of my favorites is um, working with a high, schools, high school students in a particular school where they were doing silk screening um, and they wanted to form it as a worker co-op and they've grown so much that they had to actually um, move outside of the school but the point is that they have generated enough business where they're selling um, you know, gym t-shirts or other kind of t-shirts to the Department of Education and other schools. And when they first came to us, I, I work at the Community and Economic Development Clinic, they had already went to a different lawyer. Um, and the lawyer was like, no, you can't do this because you're underage and you can't sign contracts, which is true. Um, but I said, okay, well then let's sit down and let's think more creatively. Um, so, you know, we got a couple of adults enough so that the signing of the contracts were valid um, and the business could get off the ground. So I guess the other thing that I want to say is that I, I think sometimes by training, lawyers are naysayers because we tend to be very risk at first. But I think the newer generation is much more, uh, is past generations have also been creative, so I need to just check myself. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a new energy to try things new, um, and also with all that's going on in the world, there's actually a sense of necessity and urgency that may not have been there before. Um, so, Yeah, I love that example about the high school students. It would be wonderful to see um, high school students in Louisville to be running some kind of cooperative um, business. So um, I've been sharing with Professor Huertas Noble a little bit about Louisville and some of the issues that we've been facing here. And um, so I've talked to her about how we unfortunately have long existing racism, um, redlining, um, disinvestment in certain neighborhoods and how this has resulted for us um, maybe most strikingly recently in a very high homicide rate but ongoing that um, people lack access to food um, which is a big issue with the food the community grocery initiative here um, youth lack places to gather Children don't have care, which you can start imagining like a child care mm -hmm. cooperative, right? Where the parents run the business and share taking care of the children. Um, our a shortage of affordable housing where everything at the entry level just sells in a minute right now. Um, and you've mentioned the living wage mm -hmm. um, issue and we definitely have a shortage of living wage jobs here in Louisville. Um, so we were hoping to just pick your brain about um, models, other cooperatives that you've seen that might have been in places that face similar issues that we might use as a role model for our city. I, I know that Mondragon has existed for more than 60 years and if, you, if you're not familiar with Mondragon, they have the largest network of worker cooperatives um, that are interconnected actually. Um, and they started right after the war um, and it was a very impoverished community. Um, the Catholic Church sent a priest. Uh, that priest went back and sent someone else because that's, that's how bad things were looking. Um, but even within such devastation, they were able to come together. Uh, they started with a school um, and created the first kerosene lamps. Um, and, and after that, you know, their, their bank is cooperative, their university is cooperative. Um, so 
I realize I just said 60 years ago, so to bring it up a little bit. Oh, uh, and could I just, just for the people not familiar with Mondragon, it's um, located in Spain in the Basque region, but they have cooperatives all over the world. Um, and Professor Huertas Noble and others involved with the union cooperative movement here in the U.S. are partnering with Mondragon at this time. Mm -hmm. And then I would just say, as a, um, not to make it about me, but as a resident of the Bronx and having grown up in the South Bronx when it was literally burning in terms of landlords setting fires to their buildings because they just wanted the insurance, um, banks redlining the community in terms of not making any loans, um, redlining of housing in terms of the federal government actually saying having racial covenants that restricted people um, from living in certain places. All of that happening at one time. And there were people who were able to leave, right? And there were people who were not able to leave. And there were people who decided to stay. And even amongst the kind of decay, and you know, the Bronx still has the highest asthma rate. Um, there, there are a lot of social ills, but there are pockets of hope. Um, the idea is that the community got together, the first thing that they did was stabilize the housing stock in terms of having somewhere to live, right? Um, and then after that, creating nonprofits for services that this, the city and the state were not providing. And then from there, kind of going to, okay, let's start our own businesses um, and now worker co-ops. So, and I, and I think even in even in poor communities, poor in the sense of economics, there's there's a lot of richness, right? In terms of people helping each other, it, it's it's usually um, that's usually present. Uh, so with childcare co-ops, there have been a number of them that have been formed to really help women get to work and and keep employment and and dads as well. Um, so I would just say that even when we're faced, and even under this administration, I'm, I'm just speaking for myself, um, even when we're faced with some of the darkest hours, um, we need to look to the people who want to see something different and work in collaboration and not in silos in terms of individually doing cross collaboration. Um, to really come up with new structures and a new way of being um, that is more fair and equitable to to everyone in the community. Um, you know, I can't say that race racism is going to be gone tomorrow because it's not. Um, but we need to come together and figure out, okay, how are the ways that we protect ourselves as we navigate the world, knowing that these are some of the issues that we're going to have to face. Um, so. Like a lot of immigrants who started small businesses, um, part of that was because you know they weren't being hired. So similar with um, different communities of color or other marginalized communities, um, coming together and creating our own jobs to the extent that we can, and then keeping it within our community and seeing the benefits that that has in our community is really inspiring to me. And even when now when I walk down, um, I know folks may not be familiar with the South Bronx, but there are portions of it, and, and it's a, it looks like a completely different place. So there aren't those burnt out buildings anymore. Um, and there's lots of development in terms of affordable housing. Um, but the community did such a great job that now the challenge is with gentrification. But we were working to send that back as well. Um, so I was going to throw in a legalistic question since we are all law students and lawyers and law professors <laughs> here. <laughs> so um, could you tell us when you are sitting down with one of your clients and you're deciding about how to incorporate, um, how you go about that? So. So uh, many of us know you could incorporate as a more traditional company, right, as what we think of as a corporation, or you could incorporate as a limited liability corporation, um, which provides a different tax structure, a different um, 
safety net in terms of if you went bankrupt and owed debts, who you would have to pay. Um, but then in many states, you can incorporate as a cooperative, and in a handful of states, you can incorporate. <laughs> I can hear myself. <laughs> and in many states, you can incorporate as um, a work, in many as a cooperative, and in a few as a worker owned cooperative. So um, in Kentucky, we don't specifically have a worker owned cooperative statute, but we do have um, two cooperative statutes. So I was going to ask about how you advise clients about this. So, in terms of the incorporation process, um, usually do not recommend the corporation in terms of double taxation um, and usually recommend the limited liability company because it's so flexible it's pretty much like silly putty whatever you like about the business corporation law you can take that and put it in whatever you like about the cooperative statute at least in New York you can take that and put it in um, so it leaves for a lot of flexibility and we also are at a point where limited liability companies have been around long enough that in terms of foreseeing or testing for consequences, there's enough case law to kind of inform our counseling in terms of what will happen if certain things go wrong. Um, under the cooperative statute in New York, it's harder because it's a new statute. Um, just like when the limited liability company statute was first created, a lot of attorneys did not recommend it, again, because of the, we didn't have case law to, to try to figure out, um, to help us figure out what certain ramifications would be. And that's the same thing with the cooperative statute in New York. The only thing recently what I've been thinking about, and others as well, is that um, in New York, if you don't form under the cooperative statute, then you cannot have co-op in your name. So there are a lot of co-ops that exist, but people are not aware that they're co-ops because attorneys, including myself, have created them as limited liability companies. Um, so we are actually in the midst of talking with the state legislatures to change the co-op statute and make it more, one, understandable, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but in New York, the, the cooperative statute is embedded in the business corporation law, and then whatever doesn't, whatever is not mentioned in is called Section 5A, then you have to follow the business corporation law. It can be very confusing for folks, um, so that's why we don't do that. But in terms of movement building, working with the legislature to make the changes will be really helpful and then, because part of the problem with worker co-ops is a lot of people say we're not even aware that they exist. So having, because at first I was like, that's kind of a small issue. Um, and then of course my client schooled me and was like, no, it's not a small issue because this is about um, base building and making, creating more awareness about worker co-ops. Um, so they, they convinced me that it makes sense. I, I just, I was like, oh, I don't know about amending a co-op statute when we could just get the work done. People need jobs now. People, but you know, that's kind of, it's short-sighted on my part, but also it comes from a good place. But so now it's about trying to balance both. Like, let's get people good jobs now and also work on these long-term issues. Just like in medicine, right? You need both preventative care and emergency room care. So that's the, the frame that I'm looking at it now. And that's how I counsel clients. And then obviously they get to decide at the end of the day which, which um, entity they actually wanna choose. And here in Kentucky, we have an interesting um, legal issue that um, Ryan Fenwick, who's here in the room, um, has looked into where even if you incorporate under the um, cooperative association statute, you still cannot use the word co-op in your name. The only ones that can use it are those under the agricultural cooperative statute. So we definitely need a similar um, outreach to our legislature to have that fixed. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pivot to um, what I'm most interested in right now at this current time. Um, as both Dean Crawford and Professor McNeil mentioned, 
Um, I've been writing about worker cooperatives and involved with the program um, for this, but currently I'm writing about something known as union worker-owned cooperatives, so we shorten it to union um, co-ops. And so when you're looking at a union co-op, you now have a situation where the workers still own the company, but you also have workers who are represented by a union, right? And so in any instance when the owners are represented as a union or the members, whichever term mm -hmm. you prefer, are represented um, by a union, you have a union co-op. So sometimes this can happen because people are dissatisfied with their working conditions, just like in a traditional firm, and they unionize. But right now, as I mentioned before, we have a movement where unions are partnering with those in the cooperative movement. And so they're lending their resources, their knowledge, their expertise, their finances to actually getting these worker cooperatives up and running. So the question I always get, and I think Professor Wart does Noble always gets it too, <laughs> is well, why in the world would worker owners want to unionize? They already own the company, right? So we can talk a little bit about why they might want to unionize. So some of the reasons um, that you might not think of off the top of your head is that um, union members, especially in the trades, they're very skilled. The union provides them training. And so if you have a company, say there's one called Sustainergy, which is a worker-owned cooperative in Cincinnati, and they do energy retrofitting. They go into your building, into your house, right, and they help you energy retrofit. Well, it's good for them to partner with the unions because that way they get skilled labor, right? So they can get the experts that you would need to work on somebody's building. Um, another thing about unions, they get a bad rap sometimes in the press, but they're very skilled. I mean, at base, a union is just the workers who work somewhere joining together, right? But they have institutional knowledge and expertise in dispute resolution. So when grievances mm -hmm. come up in the workplace, which can be really common with a new company, especially a community-owned company where people are trying it out for the first time, then you have someone that's a resource with an established process to kind of settle these workplace grievances before it turns into a suspension or a termination or something that just draws away from mm -hmm. the work. Um, so those are some of the reasons. And then I think that um, Professor Huerta Noble will share with us some of the reasons she's seen on mm -hmm. the ground that people want to unionize in their work around. I think um, the first time that I interviewed Cooperative Home Care Associates, which is the largest worker-owned co-op in the U.S., um, had the question about okay, they were a worker co-op first and then they unionized. And his name is Keith Joseph. He said to me, he was like, well, we had a grievance procedure before they were unionized, but no one took advantage of it. And I was like, okay, well, why is that? And he was like, well, just imagine if you have a grievance against the person who does the scheduling. You're not going to put that grievance in because you will get the jobs that most people don't want to have. Um, but once they became unionized, then the grievance procedure was used a lot more often. Um, and I think it was just having that outside presence. And again, like um, Professor Levison was saying, the union is skilled at dispute resolution. Um, so there, there's definitely that. With Cooperative Home Care Associates, um, it was a different time, but they were also able to use the union's political clout to get the Medicaid reimbursement rates up, which meant that they could then pay their owner members more. Um, and then they had a contract with the city, which also helped to make sure their doors stayed open as a business. Um, I've seen unions, again, echoing what Professor Leverson said, who have helped people get into trainings that are very hard to get into, um, particularly I'm thinking OSHA, um, occupa Occupational Safety and Health. Um, and now that co-op is going around and inspecting buildings, especially after Sandy in New York. Um, there's still a lot of buildings that are being built or have been built that need to be inspected. Um, 
And then the other thing is, it, it's not only about what the worker co-op can get from the union. Um, I think it's important to also stress what the worker co-op can give to the union. And the example in Denver with the taxi cab and um, co-op, it has a thousand members. That was a thousand new members for that union. I believe it was CWA. Um, and the two are mission aligned in terms of avoiding worker exploitation, making sure people get paid well. So it, it seems natural for them to work together. And then at the same time, sometimes it's a little bit difficult because the union is used to, some unions are used to taking a very adversarial stance. Um, so there's some, there is an effort to try to work through that um, because it's, it's a different model um, and they're, they're realizing that they're really on the same side, so it's, it has to be worked out. That's definitely um, something I've been interested in exploring. I teach dispute resolution as well as labor law, and I think it's an opportunity to transition from what we think of as a adversarial or a um, there's just a pie and you divide it up kind of negotiation into a like creation, improve the pie, increase the pie, right? And um, work together. So I think there's a lot of room to grow there for, for that. Um, so I definitely um, want to open this up for questions. I do have a few more um, a few more questions that I would like to ask, but I'm just gonna ask one more and then we're gonna open it up for you all, and then if we have time, I'll go back and throw in some other questions. But I did want to make sure that um, we don't let Professor Wart does leave without telling us about um, her work at her clinic and with the New York City Worker Cooperative Coalition. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't realize that there's been a multi-million dollar initiative in New York City to help people establish these worker-owned cooperatives. Um, and I'm very interested in finding out how we could persuade people who live in other places like Louisville, could persuade our city councils or our mayors to support such a, initiatives and um, you know what ways that government entities can get behind and aid establishing worker-owned cooperatives. So for us, um, we have workforce development programs. I'm sure everyone has workforce development programs some of them successful, some of them not so successful. Um, and a couple of groups got together. They were working with co-ops already and wrote a report on how worker cooperatives can lift um, people out of poverty. And then what we did was have a policy conference and invited elected officials. And at that policy conference, um, Carmen Del Arroyo, which was who at the time was a councilwoman, was really excited um, about what she heard, about what she read, and then what she did was she um, held a hearing. So we mobilized the community to come and speak about why worker co-ops are important, also submitted written testimony, um, and then lobbied. Um, and the first, the first round we received $1.2 million, and we also packaged it in a way that was like, we're not just interested in creating worker co-ops that are one-offs, we want to create an ecosystem to ensure that they're sustainable once they're created, um, which went over really well with them. And now I think this is the fourth year and it's over five million each year. Um, they have increased the amount of funding, which is great. And I think it's really talking to people and the policy conferences, I think, are an excellent idea. The other thing that we just recently did, um, I'm also part of an organization called One Worker, One Vote, and we had a delegation of about 14 elected officials go to Mondragon to see the co-ops themselves, to see how they're interconnected. One thing that I didn't mention, and is a quick aside, is like even when a business, one business failed of theirs, and people didn't just lose their jobs they were reassigned to other co-ops. So that intercooperation is really important and also makes me think of the union because the union has that solidarity kind of embedded in its structure um, that, that we can definitely use. Um, 
every the coalition meets frequently. We give city council reports in terms of how many new um, owner members have been created, what kind of services the technical assistance providers are giving. Um, and also now talking to them about funding for the educational piece, because it's hard to go from a worker to an owner, if you like, especially with back office stuff, um, like the accounting, unless you ha happen to be an accountant. Uh, so, and so there's the educational piece that needs funding, and that recently passed. Um, and then there's another bill to say, you know, as, as part of, I don't know if people are familiar with this term, anchor institution, um, but that the, the city's procurement process and the state's procurement process in terms of them wanting services and buying services should prioritize worker co-ops the same way that minority and women-owned businesses are prioritized. I don't like the word minority. That is in the name of the um, of the program itself. Well, great. So um, I do want to open it up for questions now. So if uh, anybody has questions that you'd like to ask, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who've been burnt down, people uh, build their own business, build their own um, like organizations. Yeah, co ops. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, like, how beneficial is it? Because, like, there are rules and specifically when investing, like, just, uh, you know, large city that there's mm -hmm. uh, heavy tax poverty, you know, not enough, you know, local good grocery groups. Mm hmm. So, uh, Did you want to repeat for the group? Yeah, so she's asking um, about the worker-owned cooperatives. How um, beneficial are they for the community, particularly uh, here in some place like West Louisville where even access to um, healthy food is, is an issue? Um, so that's her question. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's... It's very hard, obviously, to live in a place where there's a food desert or where there's not enough support for, or access to healthy food. Um, and I will give an example. Again, in the Bronx, there's a, there's a huge produce hub, and it basically distributes produce to, like, all the fanciest restaurants in Manhattan. It's great, right? It's, like, good stuff. But no Bronx resident was allowed to go in because it was wholesale and not retail. Um, so the, obviously that's not a good thing and the community got together and organized and put pressure on them and now you can go in as an individual. And you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of pausing and going slow because I know that there can be similarities between communities, but that doesn't mean our communities are exactly the same. Um, so I, I want to be thoughtful of that. But I would say, I, and I honestly believe this, that it, it, not that it should be on us, but it starts with us in terms of organizing and then putting pressure on the people that need to be put pr pressure on um, to help support and get the community what it needs. And I'm not saying that's easy, um, but the w when I've seen it work, it's mainly been there's a group of concerned citizens who get together, uh, or neighbor neighbors that get together, um, and they organize, and then they start to put pressure. You know, in, in terms of city council, if you keep showing up and, the, and it's the same issue and, and you bring other people to the table, um, they they tend to move eventually. Right, so it's not about like how beneficial, but it's just the people have to move and have to push for concerns about an issue to work towards it. Yeah, and then I just want to say, I don't think you're saying this, but I want to make sure that I'm not coming across judgmental. Um, if 
I don't know if this is true of the West End. If you live in a place where there's a food desert, chances are there are other issues going on as well, right? right? So in terms of you might care really deeply about this issue, but you don't have the personal time to really commit to the issue. And that's fair, right? Because you, you have, I'm not saying you in particular, but you might have a family, you might have a job, whatever the case may be. But it is about trying to then at least find people who, who may have more time. Um, or even if you could like structure it within a school project, um, an organizing project. So where there's places where you would have already had to commit time, you can use, carve out that time to really focus on some of these issues. Um, because I think the food, if a food desert is the other like term of art, um, which means if people aren't eating healthy, usually that means diabetes, going to bed hungry, you know? So it, it's like, it's a serious issue and, and kind of, that's why when I talk to people, even, even if I think they, got, they know it, I still like to stress, let's remember what it means to not actually have healthy food, and then let's remember that that also affects our longevity in our community, um, in our communities. So, and I wanted you know. to add, um, I don't know if you're already familiar with Jessica Gordon Emhart's work, but um, she's also a professor at. Um, City University of New York, but she's an economist, mm -hmm. but she just wrote an amazing book um, where she documents the history, black history in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and how often um, cooperatives were used as a solution when government or other people weren't stepping up, but also when people were victims of violent racism. And so part of the reason that the history hasn't been recorded is because when you're being targeted, right, you don't record your history. And so her book just is, might be something you, you could, if you get assigned a reading for school, right, maybe you could pick this book. Um, or, you know, she's on, you can go online and find her on YouTube if you'd rather do that, right? You have a few minutes mm -hmm. to spare then go on and find her, Jessica Gordon Empart. And I think that that can really show how um, part of black history is about cooperatives and cooperative mm -hmm. economics. It's just that we don't always, we don't learn that in our schools mm -hmm. a lot. Right. Yeah. Yes. And the, the name of her book is Collective Courage. Okay. Is there another, did I see a hand in the back? <laughs> yeah, the gentleman in the orange shirt. I, I have a question. I don't know if I can add to this. Yes, obviously. Oh, but you're welcome to ask whatever question you'd like. Okay, what's your, what's your uh, thoughts on gentrification? What do you, how do you feel about it? Thoughts on what? On, oh, so the question is, what are your thoughts about gentrification? Um, so I'm definitely not an expert in gentrification, but I think that communities are going to thrive when they own their own businesses. So I am a personal advocate of worker-owned cooperatives for the reasons that um, mm -hmm. Professor Wartes Noble has spoken of. But I think that other forms of cooperatives where community own things as consumers are also shown to be very beneficial. Gentrification to me is more that outside developers come in and they basically take over and force the people who are living there um, out and that's not really a solution. Those people still have to go live somewhere else. So I'm a strong advocate um, of standing to stay in your communities and to start your own opportunities. Um, and I'm sure yeah. Professor Wartes Noble does a lot more work around that issue than I do, so I think she can answer. You know, I, I think the, the, the questions about gentrification are tricky um, for some uh, in terms of it depends on how you define gentrification. So I always like to tell people, I'm not saying that I'm against um, gentrification because I don't want white people in my community. Right? I'm just being honest, that's, that's, that's usually the feedback that I get. I'm saying, if you are building new affordable housing in the Queens, um, 
that, and you're getting government tax breaks, some of that housing should be affordable for the residents who are already living there, not for new residents. And even if, even if it was me to come in as a person of color, there's still the socioeconomic class issues that are involved in that, right? And a lot of times when communities work so hard and improve their community, it's right at that moment that the gentrification tipping starts to happen. Um, but what I will say is that I think cooperative housing is key and home ownership is key because what research has shown is that the communities most vulnerable to gentrification are the ones that have the highest r renting populations, right? Um, so I, I, I think that is a real struggle um, and it's something that communities need to be aware of and it would be great if there were planning commissions that included current residents, city officials, um, because cities really contribute to gentrification in ways that sometimes are not obvious in terms of tr where they put transportation. They don't do infill. Infill is like there's a vacant lot and then you build your building. No, it's, it's more the landlords, again, harassing people to get out um, and then upping the vent rents. And I mean, it, it's, at least in New York, it's so, the harassment is so prevalent that they had to pa pass anti-harassment laws in terms of um, harassing the tenants to get out so to make room for people who could pay more. And there's, um, in Cincinnati, they've done something that's um, where, you, where you have a cooperative housing, which um, you just mentioned, and that enables people to um, own their homes, and so that can be an interesting solution. Um, Ms. Turner, did you have a question? Okay, so the question is, what is the value for the cooperative worker at either death or retirement? So their, their, um, their wealth building institutions, like any other ownership interest in a company. So when you retire, you end up with wealth that, I mean, you have an ownership share, you sell it back to the cooperative, you have wealth that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, have. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I actually have not worked with a group who has spoken to me about death benefits. Um, but in terms of retirement, it depends on how the co-op decides to structure itself. There's something that's called internal capital accounts, and a lot of times that just means there's a portion of the profits that belong to you, but I'm going to hold on to it. Um, and then upon your retirement, you can access it. Now, there's some, there's some controversy in that a lot of times co-ops want to make sure that the next year is affordable. Um, so if I had paid $500 to become a member of a co-op, when I leave, I'm, I'll only get 500 Now, that doesn't seem fair to me, especially if you've been working at your co-op for a long time and you've built up the valuation and all the, you know. Um, so the idea is to try to find a compromise of, okay, we have to keep the share affordable because we really do want it to continue and be anchored in the community, while also making sure someone can live after they retire, um, so. Um, yeah, the young lady in the second row. Um, so the question is, how do you even get people to start a co-op? How do they go about spreading the word and actually um, establishing the co-op or the network of co-ops? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, it depends. That's a very prof professor response, right? 
Um, I think that if you're starting a business that requires low capitalization, you don't need a lot of money to start it, it can get off the ground faster um, and you can see success sooner. If it's something that requires high capitalization, like a restaurant, um, it usually will take a longer amount of time and um, require outside investment. But in terms of how do you get people interested, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, um, you know, if if you if you're part of a community group, or you're part of a nonprofit, or you're part of a church, and there's a service. A lot of the New York co-ops are service co-ops. There's a service that's not being that's not available to you and others in your community. Usually, people will kind of coalesce around that um, and become interested. And we also have the organization that I was mentioning, um, One Worker, One Vote. The one of the other co-founders is the North American delegate of Mondragon, um, and. Seriously, if people are interested and want to think about ways to do it, um, we are always happy to consult and, and work with folks to, to start co-ops. Um, we want to push union co-ops, but we also work with folks who just want to form worker co-ops as well. Um, so in terms of templates and, and things like that, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you could just tailor it to your specific needs, we can, we can provide that um, and be helpful in that way. Yes, Alan. So the question is, um, he's worked in restaurants and he's interested in the labor management relations structure at Colors and what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, that, at least when it first started, I, I will have to say and admit that we kind of over-lawyered that project. Um, <laughs> But the idea was to have labor be sovereign and really in control. And even if you were a owner member, if you were on management, then you would not necessarily be part of a union. Um, and also these labor management councils. So before it gets to the board of directors, there's that committee that meets and they identify the problem and then they make a recommendation to the board. And actually, a lot of boards have said they usually just go ahead and follow the, the um, Labor Management Council's recommendation. Um, the, the interesting thing about restaurants, and I was telling my students the other day, is that one of the delays was that they couldn't find a chef that would also be and own a member, and I don't know if most folks know, but chefs like to rule <laughs> their kitchen pretty much with an iron hand. Um, so it delayed the search, but they finally found someone who, who was willing to um, be a member owner. Uh, the difference was that that person did get paid more, but they didn't get more um, they didn't get a greater percentage of the profit sharing. The profit sharing was equal, but the person's pay was higher based on education background, loans, that kind of stuff. The question is, is there still a tip-based model for the service staff or under cooperative model, does it take a different form? I, I don't actually know the answer to that um, structurally. I, I know in the beginning, certainly um, people still give tips. Um, and even understanding that the owner members were getting a living wage, right? Because our tip-based system is a racist system. Um, it's a system where, I mean, 
I don't know how much in Kentucky, but you could get like $3 an hour, and then everything else you make is supposed to be based on tips, right? And then people could kind of treat you any way they want if you're relying on tips. So even though there's no need to rely on tips anymore within the co-op structure, customers kind of always tip. Um, but yeah, I, I think a tip-based system on its own is a terrible system. I'm sorry, oh, they I are able hearing. to make, yes, they are able to make a living wage without relying on tips, yeah. yes. Yes, Mr. Klump. Um, this co-op policy, is this, how do they, uh, do they ever try and expand to other cities? And what would be some of the difficulties of trying to take a template of what is successful in one city and trying to organize and tailor it to the other mm -hmm. uh, aspect of the economic system? So the question is, um, since these are local, do they ever replicate and um, move into another city? And what would some of the challenges of that be? And then actually one of the questions I was interested in that we didn't get to was um, about replication. I mean, I, I think that there are co-ops that do replicate and go to other cities. Um, I, I have gone to Pittsburgh. Um, and I was also talking about yesterday the Rocky Mountain Employee Ownership Center. Um, but what I say to people when they ask me to come to help in that capacity is I say, okay, I'm more than happy to do it. Let, let's find a local person as well and so that it's more authentic in terms of localizing and, and tailoring it and not just talking about it. Um, and then with Cooperative Home Care Associates, they actually have a paraprofessional um, health care institute that's designed to duplicate CHCA in other states. Um, and that has been met with some level of success. Um, so, and, I, and with the union co-op movement and One Worker, One Vote, we're, we're trying to do the templates and always say, I've worked with the folks in Ohio too, um, Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative. It's like we need, I don't know if you're a lawyer, but, but I'm like we, we need a local lawyer um, and we need local people to make sure that we're not coming in thinking we're some kind of answer to someone else's community issues. It's about learning from each other, right? So th that that's kind of the model. Would it still be Um, I think that it depends on the company. Like if it was a restaurant, I would say it's separate for liability purposes in terms of a food industry. Um, and so far they have been separate. But places mm -hmm. like Mondragon, they not only have um, companies in Spain, but they have companies all over the world. Um, and there are some employee-owned companies that there's a really um, short and interesting film called We the Owners that if you guys are interested in this concept, you could, um, it's in our library. Um, yes, Professor Harris has the movie. Um, but in there, there is a company and they do decide to open up another part of their company um, in another part of the US and it documents the discussions that they had as owners and the debate about this. And there, there was a critique of Mondragon early on when they went global that they didn't adhere to the same ethos that they were adhering to at home. Um, but, and, um, but they course corrected, which is a good thing. Uh, the other thing is Mondragon now has a um, consulting agency called LKS and they are helping to set up union co-ops um, across the states as well, and also insist on working, having learned those lessons with folks who are organizers, teachers, lawyers, whatever the coalition is made of, um, to make sure that they're part of the process and part of the planning.
So the question is about the education piece, because if you are going to have somebody who hasn't been an owner and now they are an owner, um, what does the education piece look like? How do you move someone from the point of being kind of just an employee um, into the point of being a, an owner? I would say that um, that that's definitely the educational piece. There is um, the part of that is also about political education and how to work together collectively, and that does not necessarily mean that there has to be a consensus for everything. Um, but ongoing education is critical to the success of most most co-ops. Um, and then classes on, even if you, when you first open your co-op, you personally cannot do the books, at least have classes for your members so that they can read a financial statement so they could provide meaningful oversight um, of the person that they hired to do it. Um, there's also other models in, not only in New York, where the no, there's a nonprofit that incubates the uh, worker co-op. Um, and they do a lot of the training and, and getting, bringing people up to speed and, and getting them ready. Um, on a larger scale note that you were mentioning, um, one approach has been to identify businesses. Um, they, they say there are a lot of baby boomers who are retiring and their children don't necessarily want to take over the business um, and targeting those folks in a good way. Um, to convert their business to co-ops and then sell it to their own um, employees, which I, I'm a big fan of that model because it's good to take over a successful business. There are times when you convert a business that's not so successful, but I feel like that's, that's an added burden for the prospective owner member. And I would just add that um, there's a thing called an employee stock option program and um, in some instances, it's run very participatory. It's another way that employees can own their business. And we do have those here in Kentucky, and they do have a lot of experience in training their employees in financial management. And the people involved with that are very willing to help. So they would be a really good group to reach out to, to get more specifics about what the and I'm happy to give you a name um, later on, Leslie, uh, about what the specifics would look like. Um, and in the, if you watch that movie, We the Owners, there's a guy who talks about his financial literacy and how he learned it, and then he was able to go buy his house, you know, buy a house without a real estate agent because he had the financial know-how to do it. So it has real um, benefits to people in other parts of their life when they learn that. And I think there's other educational aspects that can be needed. Um, in Cleveland, they really had a lot of training on just managing um, family and life issues and work and balancing those together. So there can be all kinds of um, education that can be helpful. What stages did you tell me? Um, the, the movie? No. No? <laughs> Oh, there's so there's um, ESOPs, E S O P, um, and, and and there's one I think it's called Team. I would have to look up its name, but there's one in Lexington that's very participatory. Um, if you send me an email, I can tell you his name and that company I'm not name. A law student, so you have to no, I'm happy to give it to you. Oh. I know you're not a law student. <laughs> I recognize the law students in here. Yeah. <laughs> but he might even, you know, if you guys can have guest speakers or whatever, he might be able to come in and talk to a class or something. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's not a question, but even if there's a counselor at your school or there's someone at your school who can help you champion it, um, that would help too. Um, yes, Amanda.
So on your way out, please pick up a flyer about the community grocery that Amanda has left up here for you. If you want to become involved in cooperative economics, this is a real example of cooperative economics in West Louisville.